out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense. Hi everyone. Welcome to this episode of Meet Me in the Field, our podcast about spiritual journeys and spirituality in general. Today I talk to Jules, a British friend of mine whom I met in recovery. Jules and I do not only share our addiction and our journeys through recovery and spirituality, but in our much younger days, both of us were also committed and dedicated track and field athletes with various levels of success, meaning Jules was much better at it than I was. If you hear us talking about training, that is what we are referring to. Jules has an open-minded and inclusiveness pertaining to her spiritual path, which I find very interesting. I hope you do too. Hey Jules, how are you doing? I'm good, Sally, thank you. How are you? I am very well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate the effort you're making. You're welcome. So I got to know you about two years ago, I reckon. Yeah, more or less exactly. I remember when I first got to know you, you you seemed kind of, what's the word I'm looking for, lost? And then you disappeared for a while and you came back and suddenly you were just different. You seemed to be more anchored, more centered, more focused. What happened? Um, It was with regards to what this podcast is about. It was my spiritual journey reawakening itself. I'd, I'd been through the dark times. I was always spiritual. I was brought up to be spiritual. But the dark times took me to places that just closed that off to myself, to the inner spirit, to everybody else's beautiful spirit. And then the second time that you saw me, I'd opened up and, as I'd like to say, it saw the light, as so to speak. You say you grew up spiritually. Was that with religion or how was that? I went to Sunday school. I went there because my mum was going to church, but my father was not a very religious person. He knew about the Bible. He could not so much quote from it because his sayings were, it's not what's in the Bible, it's what's not in the Bible. And if you can read between the lines and you can actually turn the Bible round to spiritualism and something that's way above religion. Spiritualism is something that you've you've got to live for even in the good times and it's what keeps you maintained in that. So my dad was very, very, very spiritual. He he used to get frustrated sometimes because he knew that there was something way above as we are as human beings. He was a very good counterproductive spiritual being. He would go and he would always see the good in people. And I'd often look at him and think, but that person's done you wrong. Oh, you're stupid. (laughs) Yeah, why? You know. (laughs) But, and it's only since me seeing the light this time. And yes, it is through addiction recovery. Because when in through addiction, you're suppressing your inner spirit, your inner child. And your inner child is just fighting to get out. And I think that's one of the fights that you don't realise is happening when you're in the grasps of addiction. Your inner child's knocking on the door saying, just just let me out, just let me be. It was, I would say, two, maybe three years before I got into recovery. And I didn't know if it was real or if it was just a very lucid dream. The dream was me sat with my back against a huge oak tree in the shade. And the next thing, some something was pulling at my trousers. And I turned round and sat at the side of me was a little girl, blonde girl, ponytail, looking up at me, crying. I didn't know what to take from that. I just thought it was a little girl who was upset. But the more I've thought about it and the visions and the thoughts have come back to me via meditation, that was my inner me. And I'm trying my hardest at the moment to have the same dream, but I want to take her somewhere. Ah. I don't know where I want to take her. So I think that was the search of, you know what got me into spirituality again, and to lead a spiritual life. So when you came into recovery, that was when the lights went on for you? Yes, because I'd stopped suppressing. Different things happened to me during my life, and it's only now that I'm looking back and I'm I'm thinking, well, that happened for this reason, and that happened for that reason. 
But one of the key words for a uh, spiritual journey, I think if you're on a spiritual journey, you've got to learn the gift of forgiveness. Mm. And that's where that part about my father came in. Because if somebody does a wrong to you, you going through life angry and bitter towards that person, is only it's only consuming your energy. Absolutely. If you can forgive, not so much for them, but for you, then you can move on to the next part of your journey. It is just about seeing the good in everything and everybody. Not making excuses for people, Yeah, I want to add. If somebody does a wrong, they do a wrong. But seeing the good in things, and it holds you back. Even little things like road rage. Yeah. They could be having a bad day. Yes. We've all been there. So what I'm hearing you saying is perception. No, it's attitude. Yes. You you can either have the attitude of retaliation and negativity, or you can choose to see the positive in people. Yes. And focus on that. Mm -hmm. Live live good instead of the bad. Yes. You were very close to your father. Yes, and I still am. He died recently. He died four years ago. Okay. Yeah. What do you mean if very, you say you still quick. are very close to him? I'm very, I'm very spiritually connected to him. Okay. Very spiritually connected to him. Six months after he passed away, I went to see a psychic medium. And my dad had come through straight away. And when he came through, the feeling that I'd never felt before, and it was as though somebody was pressing down on my left shoulder... And when he told me that my father was through and around, I just asked, as you do, nosy, where is he? He said he stood behind your left shoulder with his on your shoulder. So that, that feeling, when I get it, I know he's there. And I carried on using after that with, with addiction. Didn't, really, didn't feel it again after that until I walked into the rooms of NA on okay. the, the first... The first time. The first meeting? The first meeting that I went to for me, because I went to two for Mark Milestones. The first one for me. That's why I saw you the first time. Yeah. yeah. I had an unbearable force on my left shoulder and just a whisper in my ear. Nobody else heard it. You're home. And I knew then, don't get this feeling all the time. If I speak to him and I ask for help, he's there. I know he's there. I might not get any answers that I like, but that was my father. <laughs> he might not like the truth, but he'd always tell you the truth. And you use him as a guiding spirit. You kind of consult him a lot. I do, right. yes. I can talk to him. He knows me inside out. He knows my sense of humour because we were very, very alike. Very, very alike. We were better apart than what we were together, <laughs> but very, very similar. So when I get angry, because even when you're on a spiritual journey, you are allowed to get angry because it's an emotion. Absolutely. Just don't let the anger consume you. So I can take my anger out, not directly at him, but I can swear and I can shout. He was a Scottish soldier. Oh, so, word. Okay. You know. Scottish soldier. Yes. <laughs> so you can imagine the language was choice. <laughs> so I can get angry and I can swear and I can shout. And he'll just exactly the same, love me unconditionally. I'll never forget the first time in recovery that I got angry. Anger was never an emotion that I was allowed to feel as a child. So I never learned what anger was. So I always suppressed it. And that's possibly one of the things that I used on. Mm -hmm. And I was in traffic and somebody did something really stupid in front of me. And I, I went, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm angry. And mm -hmm. it was such an awesome feeling to realize what I'm feeling is anger. And it's justifiable and it's okay to feel the anger. Mm -hmm. It's just, what am I going to do with it? I decided to feel it, mm -hmm. to express the fact that I'm angry. But I didn't do anything with it. I just sat with it. Mm -hmm. It didn't kill me. It was completely okay. Mm -hmm. It was such a powerful thing to allow myself to feel that. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was highly spiritual. Mm. I allowed myself to feel a feeling which I've always suppressed. Mm. Do you have a concept of a higher power? I do. And I refer to it as a him, just my thing. My higher power is not my father. My father is part of my higher power. Okay. My higher power is, like, again, I've said, it's higher than... You can't get any higher. Everything that I looked for and everything that my higher power is, is who I strive to be okay. within. 
So you have the understanding, you have the loving, you have the patience, you have every emotion that you could possibly think of. But most important, it's unconditional love. I'm trying now to kind of turn my life around and live with no regrets. And up to now, it's it's working. I'm sitting with things like I've had a chance to go back to the UK to potentially deal with my son, who is just a teenager, simple, n- end of. And bottom line. Bottom line, yeah. <laughs> um, but to, me- to sit and make the right decision, whereas before it would have been rash, I wouldn't have taken in consideration the ripple effect, so to speak, and I'm loving that word at the moment. <laughs> But the ripple effect of things, and that's where patience comes in. I never had any patience. Mm -hmm. Never had any patience. But it's patience for me as well. Yeah. Because if I'm not okay, then nobody else can be around me. I'll never forget, I was still in rehab, and we had this pastor who came in to do just kind of spiritual talks. And I had my conjoint with my ex the day before. And as I walked into the room, he said to me, so how did your conjoint go? Which was already surprising. He actually remembered from the previous week that I was going to have my conjoint. And I said, we went okay, but I'm not feeling well because I'm dealing with the ripple effects. And he said to me, oh, that's beautiful because you realize the ripples get weaker the further it goes. Mm-hmm. And that's such a nice thing. Yeah. You might feel the turmoil now, but mm-hmm. the further you move away from the center, the weaker that gets. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. I'll never ever forget that. It's such a powerful image in my head. When something goes wrong, I think oh, tomorrow it will be weaker, the feelings, the consequences will be weaker. Mm-hmm. It's such an awesome thing. Mm. Yeah, it is beautiful that the further out it goes, the weaker it gets. Yeah. But it's just, it is a beautiful way of describing circumstances and the power of your actions you don't realise. Absolutely. Mm. You mentioned you could go to the UK to deal with your son, but you decided not to. How do you make decisions these days? Decisions now is based on, it's kind of like the inner compass, the intuition, that's I call it the inner compass. If you listen to to your intuition, it will always point you in the right direction. Trust the gut. Trust the gut, yeah, very much so. It's it's there for a reason, we don't know what it is, it's not the heart. It's, I used to say my stomach's just done somersaults. It's <laughs> intuition, but there's, your heart isn't where you get the feeling. Sometimes your head can take over. Sometimes your head is right, but you've got to know and trust your yeah. own inner self. I like to think of my guiding spirit, my higher power, being inside me. Mm. It's not something outside. The good is already inside me. All I need to do is step into it. And that's why I need to trust my gut because that's an inside feeling that I need to trust. Mm-hmm. That's where the guidance comes from. Mm-hmm. Tell me, in terms of spiritual practices, what mm-hmm. type of things do you do? Um, I say my prayers with regards to... Um, it's a God of my understanding. I say my prayers. For you to be spiritual... Now, I'm not talking for everybody here... But for you to be spiritual and be, be working a, and living and working and acting a spiritual path, you have got to have been in the darkest, most terriblest times of your life. Because as human beings, we only turn to something bigger when we need something. When we can't anymore. When we can't anymore. <laughs> but I say thanks every day for the good times. That keeps that spiritual path, keeps it flowered and watered. So you don't pray just for stuff. No. Part of your prayer is also a gratitude, so mm-hmm. saying thank you. Yes, saying thank you. And do you ask for stuff in prayer? Mm, no, I just ask for, uh, I ask for, for my loved ones to be kept healthy. Just things that are needed, not wanted. Okay. But many a time, whether it's my own inner self or if it's somebody just having a little quick word in my ear, just before I finished, I've heard, now what about you? Okay. Because it's always been for other people. So that now is kind of, I do me first and then other people, if needed. It's not what I want because no matter, if, if you pray for something, for, you know, something that you want, you won't get it. You'll get what you need. Yeah. And it might not be what you want. <laughs> <laughs> or it even me, it even might be what you want, but it might not be in the package that you exactly. envisioned it to be. 
And for me, that was always a difficult thing to recognize that I got exactly what I want, but it doesn't look the way I thought it would. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for a while, I was kind of... Actually, no, but this is... Yeah, this, this works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you pray. What else do you do? I just try and, again, it's the forgiveness and the, just the seeing the best in people. And I find myself to other people saying, you know, you don't have to be like that. S try smiling. So... Lighten up and try smiling. How I am at the moment, I'm just turning everything round because I just can't be doing it. Because it's too much hassle to be grumpy and to be angry and to be upset. If you need to... You're not going to believe this. If you need to cry, cry. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, I totally believe in the value of a good cry. Mm. I read once or somebody said once that, you know, we, we wash our clothes and we wash our bodies. But how do we wash our souls? Mm -hmm. And... That person said that to cry is the process of actually washing our souls, mm -hmm. cleaning out all the crap. Mm -hmm. I've only been to the UK once, and mm -hmm. that was to London. Ugh. <laughs> Sorry any Londoners out there, but ugh. <laughs> and it took me a while to realise why I felt strain in the city. It, it mm -hmm. felt... I loved it. It was my first overseas experience, and I, I loved being there. I loved everything about it. But I, I had no connection with it mm -hmm. I, I, my soul kind of didn't connect to it and it took me a few days there to realize that nobody makes eye contact with me no nope. too busy absolutely it dawned on me that I felt as if I don't exist the first time that anybody connected with me on a personal level was I walked into a sandwich shop in Soho and I had my wallet and my identity document in my wallet now mm -hmm. In South Africa at that stage, well, still, you have to carry some form of identity mm -hmm. with you at all times. And as I took my wallet out to pay for the sandwich, the girl said, are you from South Africa? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, why? Said, I know, because you all carry your ID books with you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the first time somebody actually went through any Bothered. form of trouble to connect with me. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of, I think I left feeling slightly sad, mm. as if I really, as an individual, did not exist mm -hmm. we went to betty's bay and serenity oh, mm. i don't know if i could handle it but it's just <laughs> but stunning and i just can't handle this in my <laughs> <laughs> and you also mentioned earlier something about meditation is that something that you do on a regular basis it is now now it is now yeah we've sorted a room out and it was a, a little project that when Mark was where he was at with his head, I just thought, I'll give him Mark a project. Mark is your partner, Mark is my yeah. husband, yeah. And it was a project for him to, to take his mind off certain things. And I suppose it was my way of getting a room done that I really wanted. <laughs> so we did it. And it's we just call it the spiritual room now. And you just go in there and shut the door, shut the, the world out. And it's just you, yourself and I. And what is in the spiritual room? It's, uh, there was, there's Buddhas, there's crystals, there's candles, there's incense sticks, there's a huge Indian dream catcher, oh, cool. guardian angels, it's just everything that's, that's calming to do with peace, and it's just got that feeling in that room. And is that where you meditate? Yes, I do, and, and I'm able to meditate in silence now. Ah. Before... Well, good for you, I can't. <laughs> mm, before, if I was to even attempt to meditate in silence, I would all of a sudden become the lead part in an action film. <laughs> and I would, I'd, I'd cast it, I'd direct it, I'd edit it, and that was my meditation. Now, with my athletics career, I could only meditate to Richard Claydemann, the pianist. <laughs> How successful were you? <laughs> And that's how I psych myself up for the races. Oh, my word. Don't that ask how. That would me down. <laughs> Don't ask how. <laughs> and I, I hear him now and I think, why? <laughs> but no, I, am, I can actually hold my hands up and say I can actually meditate in silence now. And I listen to my body. Oh, and that's another thing I've started to do as well. Not just thanking your higher power and God is out as we understand him it or her. Thanking the vessel that our spirit was given. Ah. We forget about that. Because this is only on loan yes. for this journey. I'm a strong believer in that. This is a learning curve. This is a learning stage. Um, but yeah, thanking the vessel. And, but first of all, apologising to the vessel. Because it for has the, been misused. Yes. And obviously, 
thanking the I don't know just putting vibrations out there to the universe and just saying thank you and apologizing when need be when you I feel awful if I kick a snail now I can feel that snail's pain just knowing that it's you're always doing the right thing it sounds like a, an awareness of your actions of what you have to be grateful for for the damage we cause mm-hmm. Yeah, to very ourselves much so. and to other people as well. Mm-hmm. Talking about the vessel, has part of your spirituality been to care better for yourself? It has a, re- a recent, again, it took somebody else's downfall for me to look at my own body, and that was with Mark's diabetes. <laughs> the selfishness of it was, well, I'm not cooking twice, I'm not doing you a meal and then me a meal, yes. so I may as well join you. And I did, and I've never felt better. Oh, wow. And I've you've looked, lost a lot of weight. Mm-hmm, and it needed. I've spoken to the pharmacist with regards to me losing any more, and she's just said, if you do end up losing more, and you, but you're still doing what you're doing, you're eating healthily, it's, you don't, it's stuff you don't need. Yeah. I was never big anyway. People used to say to me, you need to eat this and you need to eat that. And I was in training, and I was seven and a half stone. And people thought I'd be about five and a half stone. So I'm not a big frame. I'm heavy, uh, so I'm not worrying too much about that. But it's knowing that the stuff that you're putting into your body. An awareness that I've come to recently, which I'm at this stage uncomfortable about, is eating meat. (laughs) I'm getting that way as well. And it's, it's such a difficult thing to come to terms with because I'm suddenly looking at the way we treat animals. And Mm -hmm. I think, but... They don't deserve that. Mm -hmm. But to make that mind switch from eating meat to not eating meat, and it's kind of not a, it's it's nearly as if it's not a physical decision. I get the feeling at some stage, spiritually, I'm just going to say, the awareness of what I do is enough. Is enough. I need to change that. I I get the same with my body as well. I would Mm -hmm. abuse my body with eating a lot of sugar and not doing exercise and being lazy and all those kind of things. And suddenly an awareness starts. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to feel uncomfortable. I'm feeling sluggish, those type of things. And suddenly I would start exercising again, start being aware of what I eat. Mm -hmm. And it's all just awareness for me. Mm. Next question that I want to know is, are you happy? Today, I am, yes. I am. And that's another thing I'm just living each day as it comes. Yes, it's nice to make plans, but proper plans. I don't expect anything from anybody. I've learnt that to expect is to be let down. Premeditated resentment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And as long as I don't plan failure, because that was a huge part of my life, then, yeah, as of today, I'm happy. Tomorrow's different. Something might happen. But as I... I, And I'm happy with my past, because I've dealt with it, and I've I've sat with it. Um, I've let a hell of a lot go, for my own sake. Not for the people, again, who did me wrong. So, yeah, as today, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Very happy. It's always good to know, just, just for today. Mm-hmm. How do you deal with disappointments? You've kind of had a year of huge challenges. There's been a lot going on with your mum, with Mark, with yourself even. I don't see that as such, as disappointments. Seeing it as, it's life. That's just how it is. It's just the way the cookie crumbles. Oh. But disappointments, as and when they arise, is it a disappointment or is it just life? Like, again, with my son, he's not becoming a disappointment. He's a young adult at the moment and he's still reverting back to being a child. Yes. I think we all do. Oh. And I think sometimes I would like to stay that way, but we've got we've got the grown-ups now. I can't adult today. <laughs> I know, yeah. I'm not in the mood to adult. It stays quite often, yeah. yeah. Oh, but being a teenager is so difficult. Oh, I feel so sorry for teenagers. <laughs> I remember my teenage years. It was I'd go back. Hell. I'd go Will back. Will you? Oh. No, yes. never, 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 ever. Thank you very much. You've got oh. no bills, no responsibilities. <laughs> all you think, all you, you know, you're thinking to yourself, your only dread you've got is, oh, I've not done enough of that homework or um, my school shirt's a bit dirty or... They, they, oh, but how bliss. was your head? Were you happy in your head? Yeah, because I was competing. Okay. Yeah, I was so competing. I wasn't happy in my head because I was competing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I put so much pressure on me. Mm. Part of my journey now, a huge part of my journey, is to work on my self-esteem. I used my sport as a way to build self-esteem. Mm-hmm. It was a form of addiction. I was just using something from outside me to give me value, to make me feel different, all those type of things. Mm -hmm. And I attached so much value to that that it made my life completely unmanageable. Okay. So um, my head was chaos. It was awful. Mm. 
But that whole thing of, of teenagers just not fitting in. I remember so well in church, and I don't know whether they did it in your churches, but in our church they would sometimes say, okay, we want the men to sing one verse, the woman to sing yes. another one, or the adults sing one and the children sing another. And I always thought, Which one what am I am doing? I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, bless you. I, I felt awful. I, I just did not know where I fit in. Mm. And that's something that I got through my spiritual journey was, I don't know who I am. Mm. And that's lovely. It's, mm-hmm. it's really an amazing feeling to know who I am and where I fit in. And if you don't like it, then I'm sorry, mm. but it all starts. Then you don't fit in with me. Yeah. <laughs> Simple. Jules, this was awesome. It was. Um, is there anything else with regards to your spirituality you want to share with us? Because what I can hear from you is there's always been some form of a spiritual foundation for you, which you were quite comfortable with. Mm-hmm through life and through addiction you moved away from that Mm -hmm. so when you came into recovery it was quite easy for you to reconnect with that Mm -hmm. and even though it's not founded in a organized religious ideal or dogma you have a very strong sense of what's right and what's wrong Mm -hmm. and you try to live the right and you discard the rest Mm -hmm. and that's your spirituality for you it is yeah and it's just as i say doing the next right thing if it feels wrong, why does it feel wrong? And sometimes you can actually turn a feeling wrong into a feeling right when you sit with it and you, you weigh up the pros and cons and it's that, again, that's patience. And just learning, I'll, I'll never possibly know who I really, really am. And to me, that is an adventure. If it's all about self-discovery and loving people on the way and accepting people and forgiving people, then bring it on, I can't, you know, yeah. it's exciting. I don't know whether I like that saying that everything will be all right in the end. If it's not all right, it's not the end. <laughs> Have you heard that before? No. <laughs> yes. Mm. That's not the way I want to live my no. life. It, it, it needs to be all right now. Mm. And I want this all rightness to carry on until the end. Mm-hmm. And that's the way I try to live my life is to to have a concept of that all rightness and to, to, to if I can, create that all rightness. Mm-hmm. Because previously, nothing was all right. No. And that was, I, I wanted it to be the end because it wasn't all right. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Very much so. Cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And Thank I really you for appreciate having it. me. You're very welcome. Have a wonderful day. And you, Freddie. Well, guys, this is it for this episode. I found this conversation with Jules very interesting. I'm quite fascinated by her ongoing relationship with her deceased father and how she is using his guiding spirit in her life. It just goes to show how open-mindedness can stand us in good stead when it comes to our spirituality. Hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. If you want to know more about what I do, please feel free to connect with me on my website, which is www.freddy.org.za, or find me on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash freddy.org.za forward slash or on Twitter at at Rensburg Freddy. Remember that Freddy is always spelt with an IE at the end. Be safe. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.